Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was interested, what are some possible uses of the accurate timing of pulsars? Oh, um, so one thing that pulsars are trying to be used for is to detect gravitational waves. So I don't know if you um, saw a, f a few months ago, I think now, they uh, announced the first detection um, of gravitational waves, these ripples um, in space-time that were predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, and so that detection was um, made by what we call, um, it was a gravitational wave interferometry um, observatory where they basically have these two um, arms, really long, kilometers long, that they shine lasers down and they measure, um, they measure how long it takes to go back and forth and back and forth. And when the ripple, the gravitational wave comes through, um, it will squish and stretch out. And so the amount of time it takes the laser to go down one end and come back will change ever so slightly. And we're talking about like fractions of a second, um, that detection was. But you can also use pulsars for that because I said they're very accurate um, timers. So if a gravitational wave comes through, you should see a little change um, in how, um, how the pulse sweeps past us. Um, why do we um, have planets? Why don't we just float in space? Why do we have planets? Oh, that's a really good question. So planets are left over um, from when stars were formed. So the pl Earth and all the other planets in our solar system, we're basically just the bits that didn't make it um, into the sun. So the sun formed out of this big cloud of gas and dust that we were talking about in the infrared, um, and gravity pulled it all together and pulled it together enough that um, it got hot enough and dense enough for nuclear fusion to start, and it started shining. Um, but the bits um, that were left over from the star forming, um, again, they started clumping together, and that's how we got planets um, around it. So we're just really the bits that the sun didn't want. <laughs> Um, can neutrinos be used to map objects that are even further away or any other objects? That yes, so we, um, we see neutrinos from um, supernova explosions. Uh, so we, saw, we detected neutrinos from a supernova that went off in 1987. Neutrinos are ridiculously hard um, to detect. There's something like, um, I think it's something like a billion going through your fingertip um, every second. They're really, they don't really interact with anything, so it's really hard to find them. The way that um, they were detected and the way that that image um, was made is that we have these huge um, underwater chambers, um, yeah, un underground water, sorry, underground chambers of water. Um, and as the neutrinos go through, they, can, they sometimes can create uh, what's called Cherenkov um, radiation, which is, um, it sort of bunches it, it, it's like a sonic boom, but for light. Um, but it's really, really hard to do. So I don't think, while we detect neutrinos from supernova explosions and stuff, we can't really use them to create images or anything like that. We don't get that much detail. So I think we've got two... We had a change of mind back again. So two <laughs> up in the gallery, <laughs> cool. and then after that we've got one over um, in the middle as well. Okay. Do you have anything to tell us about hydrogen alpha? Ooh, hydrogen alpha um, from chromoscope. Yeah, so that's um, just emission um, from the hydrogen um, atom. So it's actually, uh, when you looked at the lamp, I think hydrogen alpha is the red line that you saw in that. And so that picture, we can build up um, pictures instead of looking at um, the entire visible part um, of the spectrum. So you know how you, you take a photo and you capture all of the visible light. What we can do instead is we can use filters and so we can only pick up the blue light or we can only pick up the red light coming from objects and you can narrow it down so much that you can only pick out that um, red hydrogen light that's coming out from objects. So that's what that hydrogen alpha was. No problem. Is there another question up there? There's another one. Yeah. Uh, was it um, yeah, this one here. Has there ever oh, been really a picture? That's all right, I can see you now. Block out the lights. Has there ever been a picture of a black hole in gamma ray? Has there ever been a picture of a black hole in gamma ray? So we don't get pictures 
of black holes themselves because they're black holes. So by their very nature, the definition of a black hole is that it's something that nothing can escape from. So not even light um, can escape from it. And when I say light, I mean all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So I'm seeing you, just about, um, and you're seeing me because light is reflecting off us um, and going back. So light is reflecting off me and going back to you and going into your eyes, and that's how you're seeing me. In the case of the sun, um, the sun and the stars shine because they're giving off light themselves. But you couldn't reflect light off a black hole because the light wouldn't be, it would be get sucked in by the black hole and wouldn't um, come out again. So we can't directly take pictures of black holes, but we have, as I said, when we see our active galaxies, we're seeing the effects of that black hole. And so we're seeing things like that accretion disk surrounding it, um, we can see. And we can also see their effects uh, with things, um, something called gravitational lensing. So something like a black hole that's really massive will actually bend light around it. Um, so we can tell sometimes that they're there. The other really cool thing is that this gravitational wave detection that I mentioned just now, that was gravitational waves from two black holes spiraling together and combining, and that sent out these ripples in space. So it has been described as the first direct detection of black holes, um, because you're directly look, seeing the effect that they've had on space-time as they uh, merge together. But no, you wouldn't be able to get an actual picture of a black hole in gamma rays. You just see their effects. Great. I think we've got three more questions to go. So we've got one here in the green top, one behind on the back row, and then one here in the stripy top. How many galaxies are there in the Milky Way? Well, no, so I mean black, hole. <laughs> black holes. How many black holes are there in the Milky Way? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, again, um, because we can't see them directly... Um, it's very hard to detect them. So um, I imagine you could work out, based on the number of stars in our galaxy and how many of them would have gone um, supernova and ended up as a black hole, you could get an idea of how many stellar mass black holes there are in the Milky Way. So those are the black holes that you get at the end of a huge star's life. And then there's one supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy. So there's just galaxies will have one big massive black hole. I think our, our one's maybe about a million times the mass of the sun. It's on the sort of puny side of things. And we see that because we see there's an area of um, space in the very centre of the galaxy that stars avoid and they kind of get whipped around it. Um, so you can see there's something that must be very massive in the centre that's got gravity, but we don't see anything there. And so we figure out that that's our black hole in the middle. Um, yeah. How many... How many um, gamma, ray, gamma, gamma rays telescopes have been launched? Ooh, that's a very good question. So there's the Fermi telescope, and then there was one before that, which was the one that detected um, the sort of 30, 50 blazars I talked about. I'm not sure if there was one before that. We've only had a few. Um, and then there are, um, there are ones on the ground that detect... Um, they look really weird. They look like sort of meshes. Um, and what they do is a similar thing. They detect um, the effect of the gamma ray. If a gamma ray hits the atmosphere, it can create this particle um, shower again. Um, so there's a couple of ground observatories that pick up gamma rays indirectly. But I don't know the answer to how many we've launched into space. You'd have to look that up. <laughs> okay, then the final question here. Speaking about the Betelgeuse thing, how are you even supposed to know that it hasn't already gone supernova yet? Oh, that's an excellent point. So, Betelgeuse, the star that's going to go supernova, as I said, it's about, I think, 640 light years away from us. So, light from that star takes 640 um, years to get to us. So, if that star went supernova in the last 640 years... We just don't know about it yet. So it could have gone supernova yesterday, and astronomers 640 years from now will observe it. But then you start getting into this sort of mind-blowing thinking about what really is time and what really is now, uh, which is a really good, um, really nice thought to end on, I think. Because, you know, say the sun, 
is so far away from us that it takes light from the sun eight minutes to get to us. So if the sun suddenly disappeared now, um, we wouldn't know about it for another eight minutes because the last light emitted by the sun would take eight minutes to get to us. Uh, it's not going to disappear. There's no way that the sun could just disappear. But if that happened, but then, then you start thinking, is that really now? Um, it's very, very confusing, <laughs> but in a good way. That's great. So we'll all go away now in, on, in our most confused state. <laughs> always a good way to end. Um, so thank you very much to Dr. Jen Gupta. I know not everyone got their chance to ask their question, but come down, pick up a postcard and say hello.